Well, um, welcome everybody online, everybody else here. If you're visiting with us, thanks for being here. We've been in a series this summer. We um, are closing this series down um, this morning. We're going to end it, and I'm going to uh, kind of save the, the, the deepest, if you want to call it that, the, maybe the toughest, most challenging stuff uh, to this morning. And to leave us with kind of a bang, some big questions and some big things to think about when we think about the foundational aspects of the scriptures, of the gospel, um, foundational things, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, that everything else is built upon. Remember we've said if we get Genesis 1, 2, and 3 wrong, everything else we're going to get wrong um, in the Bible um, leading into the gospel. And uh, this morning, I want to talk about this idea of a, the great exchange. Now, many have called that, use that terminology throughout church history. It's the great exchange. I'm exchanging my, all of my mess, sin, shame, guilt, fear, all, everything, you name it, for what? For God's, for Jesus' righteousness. This is the transaction of faith that happens at salvation. There's nothing like it. I can't offer something, my works, my religion, my good works, or anything in this exchange, it is a faith exchange, right, where it's a powerful, this is, the Bible calls it being born again, right, there's many different terminology, the old life, and exchanging my old life for this new life, exchanging death, separation from God, for eternal life given from Christ, the great exchange, um, and uh, I, I hope, we'll see what happens this morning, to get through some of the, uh, I almost wanted to title this um, Back to the Blood, um, but it just sounds kind of dark. Um, but uh, uh, folks, we don't, we've gotten so far away from understanding the foundation of understanding the gospel and everything in the Bible is connected to the blood. And I'm going to show us, as best I can, I'm going to do a theology of the blood, and uh, this is and, and I believe and I, I hope as, as we see this, I hope your kind of light bulbs come on and you have a deeper sense of understanding. What, what most of us have grown up, I can promise, and correct me if I'm wrong, what some of the stuff I'm going to share about the blood you've never heard in church. You were, we haven't been taught this. Because most of evangelical faith, we stay out here on the surface. Jesus died for our sins. He shed his blood for our sins. We hear that language. But do you understand why? Why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to shed his blood? What is it so important about the blood? Right? Um, has anybody ever taught you that? Has that been a part of a discipleship program or anything else? It just shows, folks, what's happened. Culture's creeped in. We move aside this. Oh, we don't talk about that. Sacrifice, blood, shedding blood. And we just shove that aside and, and, um, and don't deal with the reality. This is foundational to the very beginning, right, of the Bible all the way through to Jesus' shedding of his blood on the cross. Why is that so important? And then the last thing I want to um, challenge us with is to really sh uh, talk about faith itself and to challenge each of us. Faith is to be a mustard seed. Faith is not something, a one-time deal. Faith is something that we have to nurture and grow and to encourage each of us how is faith growing in this house and with each other, all right? All right, so with that said, we're going to dive in. Here we go. Got a little quote for us. This is from The Atlantic, um, which is by no means, you know, uh, you know, it's definitely one way leaning. But listen to this. For some activists, politics has usurped the role that religion used to play as a source of meaning and purpose in our lives and a way to find community. But I want to replace some words because that's a very true statement, Right? And uh, this is what's happening in our culture. But I'm going to replace some words. For some Christians, politics has usurped the role that faith used to play as a source of meaning and purpose in their lives and a way to find community. Okay? This is where we're at today, folks. The culture is creeping in and has crept into the church. And for many Christians, they become political activists, and that has overridden, right, their first and our first and priority, right, which is to find the purpose, our purpose in life, and the way of community grounded in the foundations of Scripture and the kingdom of God that transcends any nation on earth. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, hold on to this. This is going to tie back into our discussion about the blood, all right? So um, we'll come back to that, all right? Here we go. 
We're going to dive in this morning. Some big questions. Why did Jesus have to die? Why is His blood, the, and only His blood, adequate for redeeming mankind? How is life in the blood? Leviticus says the life is in the blood. Right? Um, why is blood required for the forgiveness of sins? You ever thought about this? We don't. And I can promise you that for most, I, I, if you found a sermon out there on the blood, please, I want, pass it to me. If you find any teaching on the blood, please send it to me. Please, please. And so I just want to, sh- to say that, to roll out to us. Look how culture has removed the consequences of death the, the power of the blood, what really forms life. And so I just asked you this morning, what, what brings you alive? In other words, we taught we're so conditioned by science today, right? We, we forget the awe and the wonder, right, of, wow, life itself. What is it that makes me alive? What is it that makes you, you? When did your personality come infused into you? Science cannot explain these things. And, and why don't we talk about them? How did your soul come alive? When did your heart come alive? Your, your spiritual side. Right? Does that make sense? So we go back to Genesis. We go back to see that God, when He put the physical body of Adam together, He breathed life. And Leviticus says that life, that power that we read in Colossians 1, Jesus is the power that holds all things together. That's the forming of the atom holding everything together in all the universe. It's the power of God. It is the life blood. And it resides in the body. There's something far more important going on inside your blood than just the physical DNA that, that transmits who you are. Oh, science can break down the DNA, break down all that good stuff and do some things, but they have no, no idea how you became you, your personality, your uniqueness. When did you start breathing as a living spirit? Where did that non-physical right, part right, come to life, right? This is back to Genesis and foundational. So this morning, let me see, did I put this up here? No, I guess I didn't. Um, Let me go back to the passages. We're going to be in Genesis. There we go. Starting in 321. And we're going to read a little further this morning. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me and then we're going to jump to Romans real quick. Uh, Genesis 3, 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins clothe and clothe them. So after all, the, they were exposed. Their sin, their shame, their nakedness, everything was exposed. Is They tried to cover with fig leaves. This is very important as we're getting ready to read by Cain and Abel. Tried to use fig leaves to cover themselves. But God is the one who made the first sacrifice. He shed the first blood for to a covering. Listen to this language. For Adam and Eve. Okay? In other words, giving us some indication, powerful indication of uh, proper worship. How to honor God in the midst of worship, right? What do we do now that they're cast out of the garden? What do we do with worship? How do we, how do, how do we bridge this gap to a holy God and our ongoing sin, shame, guilt, fear, all of these things? Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lit, uh, now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out and at the east side of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now listen. Now Adam knew his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. And now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. In other words, the very best of the sacrifice. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. 
And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin, now listen to this. Sin is crouching at the door. This word's like, a, like an animal ready to pounce its prey. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. There's the course of the fallen fleshly nature, foundational from the beginning of Genesis throughout mankind. Is that we all come into this world separated, pushed out of the garden, right? Because of Adam's sin, right? Born in this world, out of fellowship with God, needing a redeemer, right? And with this power, this fleshly power, sin is always crouching at the door, ready to pounce, right? And ready to um, bring about its control and the consequences. And people want to say, where's all the evil? Where's this evil come? Here's where the evil in the world comes from. Now, it's heightened by the spiritual realm, right? The demonic realm, Satan, the serpent, and everything, right? Just takes hold of this sin and just magnifies, right, the evil. So how are we going to make sense? How is this world ever going to be renewed? How is a holy God ever going to walk on the earth and fellowship with, um, uh, with a fallen world? How is that ever going to work again? All right, flip forward to the New Testament, to the book of Romans, chapter 3. We'll start in verse 23. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned. Now, uh, again, I'm just using one little illustration, but folks, Genesis is foundation, one, two, and three for the rest of Scripture. This book fits together like nothing else in the world. It's supernatural. It is God's living, active Word of God to us, right? And it's time for the church to restore the awe and the wonder in the Word of God and a hunger for the Word of God and, and to get into this with faith and through the Holy Spirit and see it just come alive. And I'm just showing you one picture of how this thing knits together unbelievably, how Genesis, the first three chapters, inform the gospel preaching of Paul in the New Testament, right? Who breaks it down and brings out more life in the answers to some of these big questions that we've just... Um, uh, Put up here on the screen. So for all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and fallen short of the glory of God. Now we don't have time. You go to chapter 5 if you want to know how Adam's sin and death has affected all of mankind, right? He explains that further. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. That was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He has passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now you say, whoa, that's some big, big words right there. And they are some big words and they have some big meanings. This word propitiation, it simply means is, uh, that when it says whom God put forward, put Jesus forward as a propitiation by His blood. Pay attention throughout the Bible to the blood. By His blood. Jesus is the only one who was fully man, fully God. His blood was perfect. Sinless. The perfect sacrifice. Right? Um, and this word propitiation, it means that by that, God's wrath was withheld. You and me. Because God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Without that justice... God is not holy. To be just, He has to, what? Bring judgment, faithful, true judgment where there is sin, where there is injustice. And He will return and do that. It is the age of grace. It is the time of grace right now. And it says right here, in God's forbearance, as God was patient, He desires all to come to know Him. And He's withholding His judgment, right? By grace and mercy. And in the proper time, other scripture says that just the right time, God sent forth Jesus to be that propitiation, that Savior, the 
one whose blood is perfect, whose life is perfect, who is the perfect sacrifice to be able to fix this problem, not just atone temporarily sins like happened in the Old Testament, right? But to perfectly once for all be the perfect sacrifice, right? So that we could be the righteousness of God. It is the greatest exchange ever. My sin, shame, and guilt for the righteousness of Christ. How does that exchange happen in a life? It's by faith. It's by faith. Not by works, not by religion. And as we're going to see here, this, the, uh, um, as we look at the blood a little deeper, we will see that it just exposes the futility of religion and works-based faith. Is There is nothing but blood that can save and cover sin. Because there's life in the blood. And Hebrews goes on to say the blood of bulls and goats can never ultimately forgive sins. And you say, wait, the whole Old Testament God gave Israel, right? Look at the story of how Israel was going to live in the Shekinah glory of God. And they had all the rules and regulations of the temple. And one time a year, the priest would go into the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, before the presence and the Shekinah glory of God and sprinkle the blood on the, on the, the seat of atonement there, right? Only blood can atone. And that only, as we just saw here, only temporarily withheld the judgment, justice of God out of His mercy, waiting for Jesus to be sent to be the perfect sacrifice. And the whole New Testament is this radical thing and Paul's just overwhelmed like now, the the beginning of chapter 3, now there's this righteousness that has come apart from the law that is free to everyone. That is just received by faith. The, The blood has been taken care of. The blood guilt that resides on each of us has been covered. You just have to receive it by faith. As a child, believing, yes, Jesus, believe who you are, cover me, right? In this, in my sin with your blood, once and for all. Now, let me just step back. And do a little history about the blood. So let's go back to Genesis. When God created Adam, He breathed, right, life into Adam. And that was God's life force into Adam. When Adam and Eve sinned, and all of a sudden they're aware of good and evil again, what happened? That force just, boom, was gone, right? Not completely, but it was deep, but it was uh, corrupted, right? And... Um, and we see that God promised, He said, if you eat of the tree of the good, if you disobey my commandment, you will die. Now, they didn't die immediately. Back to Romans, God's patience, right? Um, but what happened was it cost them their blood. It cost them the life of their blood. Immediately what happened is they were separated from God and there was no longer was this fellowship and unity of the presence of God in their heart, right? Walking and talking in the garden is they were cast out of the garden away from God's presence and, and his, he's still talking to them. This is very important in, cha- in the end of chapter 3, outside the garden, but now they're toiling. They're not just cultivating with God this beautiful garden. They're toiling. They're under the curse of the fallenness uh, that has hit the whole earth that we still are under, right? Romans 8 says the earth itself is groaning, waiting for God to come and redeem the whole world um, as He redeems His children, right? And so, uh, when they were cast out, in other words, um, this life of the blood is taken. And, and they eventually die because when they uh, uh, um, sinned against God, they lost that eternal life. They, it cost them their blood. Now, we move into Adam, um, Cain and Abel. And what we see here after some you know, time has gone by and, and, and they're trying to cultivate, trying life outside the garden with all of its problems and everything... And, uh, and uh, somewhere along the way is, is they, they knew they, to, they had to worship God. And God's still speaking to them, but just removed from them, right? And, um, and they come to worship. And this gives us a little insight as to proper worship. And we have Cain who comes with, again, the fig leaves, let's just say, and, all right, uh, trying to cover his, his produce as a farmer. And we, you say, well, wait a minute. And Israel brought sheath offerings and, and grain offerings, but none of those covered sin. This is very important. 
There was, those were thanksgiving offerings and many other kinds of offerings. There was only one. The atonement took place by the priest going to the inner right, sanctum of the Holy of Holies with the sprinkled blood. Right? And, um, and so we see Abel. He was accepted, his worship, because he shed the life of a, a blem, uh, unblemished lamb and brought the best portions of meat to offer unto God. Now do you see... If it is, as the Israelites are reading this, they understand foundationally what's going on when it comes to all the laws that were given to him throughout the whole Old Testament about how to bring an offering to God. Passover itself. Ah, Passover, the shedding of the Lamb. Right? This all connects unbelievably beautifully, right? Um, so they, they brought, and, and what happened is that Abel was not, a, or Cain was not able to come with proper worship. Understanding worship, you, to be right in God, in, in right worship with God, you have to understand the blood. And when it comes to church today, this is what's missing in worship, is we don't understand the blood. We don't understand, wow, I'm under, Christ is, I don't have to bring a, a physical offering anymore, but I come understanding I am saved by the blood of of the Lamb by Jesus once and for all. And that, folks, should be foundational to our worship that should exalt the gospel, exalt right what, what God has done. But, a, but, but to bring false worship is that Cain brought false worship. And when Cain brought this false worship and, and he said that what we read that the sin's crouching at the door is ready to take hold of you is what's happened through false worship. When false worship happens, all right, Murder happens. Hatred happens. And the whole course, right, of very evil things are unleashed in the world because there's this idea that I can manage the blood without proper worship. Now, folks, why is there so much bloodshed in the world? This weaves together incredibly because when I don't have proper worship and understanding in my life, guess what? Jesus exalt, it comes to when he in Matthew uh, five where he where he uh, speaks the Sermon on the Mount and he goes deeper on the law. He said, even if you you heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, he who hates his brother or sister, right, is going to be held liable to God. In other words, Jesus goes back, what is it that causes someone to murder? It's the exact same thing that's played out here with, a, with Cain and Abel, right? It was the anger that resulted from, right, I'm not going to obey you, God. I'm not going to, right, value the blood. I'm going to do my own thing. This brings anger, and it brings rebellion against God, and the result is the shedding of blood and anger and hatred throughout the entire world. Again, it's the course of history. Why does Jesus say now to his church, wherever you are around the world, love your enemies. I say you're to love your enemies. It is only the gospel that can push back the shedding of blood and of murder, right? And um, again, <laughs> folks, just what has happened, the whole, I just want to go theological on the whole abortion issue. Forget all the talk out there. As a believer, let's get down to the nitty gritty. This is the shedding of innocent blood. It is not valuing the blood and the life-giving force. It is God who gives the life and is to honor life and honor the blood. And where does that put us as a nation before God? I'll leave that with you as you compare our nation with those in the Old Testament, right? As God takes serious the blood, especially the shedding of innocent, right, blood. But let me just catapult us into the New, into the New Testament. Jesus' trial before Pilate. Remember what happened is he's standing before Pilate and Pilate just couldn't make sense of this whole thing. Remember, before the whole raging crowd, the mob, remember no truth happens inside a crowd or a mob. So I'm going to say it again. Where there's a crowd, where there's a mob, there is always untruth. There is always the shedding of blood eventually. Okay, just take that historically, presently into our context um, here. Uh, so he's before the crowd and he brings a bowl, right? Because he knows, remember his own wife gave him a dream. Don't mess with this guy, right? And he brings the bowl and in front of the whole crowd, he's like, "Wash, hey, I am free of this man's blood, right? It is on you 
mob. And what did the mob say? Yes, it is on us. Give us Barabbas. Some of the texts say Barabbas' first name was Jesus because it was a popular name. Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas is son of the Father. The people were saying, give us Jesus Barabbas. Give us our Jesus. You know what Barabbas was? Now I'm circling back to the quote. You know who Barabbas was? Why he, he was a murderer, but what, why, was he in, why was he in jail? He was a political zealot. Give us Barabbas. We would rather take control of the blood and the problems by political and shedding blood means than receive the Savior, Jesus of the world, who shed His blood, did the opposite for us that we would live sacrificially loving our enemies following in His footsteps. Is this coming together for you? Right? When we go away from understanding the blood, it moves sin, crouching at the door, unleashes in the world, in people's life, all kinds of things. And ultimately, what we see is the course of that is just like we see with Cain and Abel. It will be, mur- it will be bloodshed. And any political means, by any, just look, right? Ultimately, what does a political movement nation do? All nations have shed blood and shed innocent blood. They're blood guilty before God. This is why God holds the nations accountable. This is why Jesus is returning, right, to judge the nations and set up God's kingdom ultimately on this earth based upon, right, Jesus' own shed blood. He fixed the problem. Now, we could say a lot more there, but I hope that, that that just gives a little taste of the power of the blood. And through the course of history, and just take ourselves right to that same thing, the mob that give us, right, Jesus Barabbas, right? Give us the politician, give us the zealot, give us the one who's going to, right, force, right, God's kingdom on this earth, right? No, no, don't give us Jesus. Don't give us that sacrificial Jesus. And folks, I'm telling you, in the church today, this is, we got to get this right. we got to make sure which is a priority in how we live and which lens, which Jesus we're truly honoring and following. Does that make sense, everyone? All right? Much, much more to dive in to on that. The great exchange. So, um, oops, there we go. I'll get us there. All right, I just want to end our time by looking at this question. What does it mean to be alive? How does grace save us? What is the role of faith? Okay? In other words, Jesus, as we read in Romans, this comes about by faith. In other words, Jesus has done all the work. God, from the beginning, knew He was going to send His Son, right? And, and, and solve this blood problem once and for all, right? And, and, and it is an offering, right? And, and go to the book of Hebrews. You can't understand the book of Hebrews unless you understand the blood. Understand that Jesus entered that temple of God and was the perfect sacrifice, opened up the heavenly host to us who by faith take Jesus as our, our Lord. And by faith, right, make this faith exchange. God, here's my, here's my will, Lord, for your will. Right? And all of faith is a great exchange. Do you know that? All of faith, living life by faith, not, we walk by faith, not by sight. All of faith is this exchange. God, I'm exchanging my question for your peace. I'm exchanging my will for your will. I'm exchanging my surrender for your truth. All right, it's just go on and on and on. It's a great exchange. And the more we see it that way, right? Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm exchanging my sin, my, my, my mess here for your forgiveness, your righteousness. Wow. I'm, I'm exchanging, God, my self-righteousness of wanting to do things for your justice. It's solved. Your mercy, right? All of faith is the exchange. And to grow, and sadly, I think most of us, I'm just going to generalize here, but I believe most of us have grown up in an evangelical church where faith is just some transaction. I'm saved. And it's just, we don't really think about And we don't think about ongoing that to follow Jesus is a life of faith by the power of the Spirit of God. It is to grow. 
And I, don't, I stay stagnant if I don't grow my faith and I don't start questioning, what am I exchanging here, God? Am I living this life for your life? And what did Jesus say? There's some powerful passages um, that he gives us. I'll just throw these up for you to look at, right? It's God's version is the best version of ourself. And our whole culture is trying to tell you that you can create the best version of your life possible. You go do this, go do this. And you know, a lot of us are doing that. A lot of us are caught up in that is I'm going to create the best version. I can manage life. I can create this great, this, this awesome, living the dream, whatever it is, right? Only God's version. And the only way to get God's version, right, for my life is this great exchange by faith. God, I'm going to take what you promise and I'm going to lay down mine. And what did Jesus say? Unless you deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. You cannot follow me. Deny yourself. Of course, we already read Romans, but Romans 8.32, it's just one of my favorites, right? If God did not withhold his son, how will he not give us all things? All things. Now, folks, that takes faith to go after all things. And now we're going to come to that, back to this. Uh, Matthew 16, Jesus says, if you don't lose your life, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, here's the great exchange. You got to lose your life to get life. What is it good if you gain the whole world, all the riches of mankind, but you lose your soul? It's a great exchange, God. I, and for the rich young ruler, guess what? He had to physically, Jesus said, well, you got to go sell it all for this great exchange to take place, Right? Um, are we experiencing? And folks, here's, here I think is the big barrier for spiritual growth is if I'm not willing to make an exchange, I'm not growing my faith. You can go to Bible study year after year. You can go to church year after year. You can be in it for years and decades and your faith never grow. You can gain some intellectual knowledge about the Bible. But if you don't start, if we don't start encouraging each other to step out in faith, I'm going to trust God on this, on His Word, and exchange my fear, exchange my worry for God's promise, I'm not going to grow. Does this make sense? Let that little mustard seed, it's to, fl- it's to grow, not stay a little seed. Right? It's growing to a big tree. Um, and ultimately, the great exchange, Galatians 2.20 is one of the best, right? Paul says this, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, right, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Wow, that's the exchange. Do you know something of that exchange? Is that how you're living? It's by the blood of Christ, right, that that can happen. All right, just a couple. I'm going to run through real quick here. Folks, our slogan here is grace, growth, and greater things. If you see around on the cub, the mugs in the cafe, the G3 symbol, that's what grace, growth, and greater things. Why is it those three? Because that's the course of discipleship that we see lived out in Jesus in the Bible. It's the course of spiritual growth we see in the Bible. It begins with grace. God's shedding His grace. We're saved by grace alone. It moves to growth. We're to grow that faith, right? And it moves to greater things. We're to minister and be like Jesus. And I've got to exercise my faith all along this way. And so the first one is just saving faith. It takes faith, simple faith. Faith of a child. Jesus, I believe you, right? And this is a surrender, right? As I learn to say, wow, grace, living in grace, surrender is better than control. Lord, I lay down my control. Faith is better than rationalism or emotionalism. I live by faith, not by my emotions. We need to Speak and teach that loud and clear today, especially among our young people. Live by faith. Living by your emotions will lead you to death and and despair. It's by faith we live, not by sight. And I surrender. I learn to surrender my emotions to God so He will transform them into the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Grace is better than karma. I'll let you break that one down. Justification is better than the wrath of God. Right? I want, I want his. I want that blood to cover me. I don't want to stand before God and try to defend myself and all my stuff. That's grace. Saving faith. That's the beginning of the journey. We, we don't ever leave it. We live under it every day, right? And then that moves us to growth. This is sanctifying faith. In other words, this is we're to be made holy. We're to be like Jesus. And I have to start exchanging some things. Lord, here's my lust. Give me a pure heart. Here's my filthy language, God. Give me language of grace. Am I making sense here? 
Does somebody challenge you on this? You will never grow just by showing up and reading the Bible and all that. We've got to do that. But without the exchange, I think this is one of the biggest barriers to lack of growth today is somebody calling you out, somebody calling me out. Take a step. Have you exchanged that for what God promises? Right? Believing holiness is better than worldliness. Consecration is better than consumerism. I'll let you break that. That's a whole other sermon right there. Pleasing God is better than pleasing man. I want to grow, God. I want to be like you, Jesus, not like whoever out there. I stop comparing myself to people around me. I have one, I compare myself to Jesus. Whoa, I got a long way to go. And that just helps me live graciously with others, right? That's growth. And then, folks, we don't stop. And all these work to greater things. This is charismatic faith. Not charismatic like you might be thinking. Charismatic like the biblical word, charisma, which is the gifts and power of the Spirit. This is how Jesus lived. He lived by the power of God. Many stall out in the church in those first two, saving grace and and growing grace, and they don't even think about charismatic faith. It's an exchange. I exchange, Lord, my weakness for your power, God. I exchange my means for your means, God. Jesus' way of ministry is better than man's tradition or best business practices. Man, how many times have churches adopted business? This is not a house of business. The church of God to run on different principles, a different economic basis than the economics of the world. We have a God who provides supernaturally, right? Power of the Spirit is better than programs of man. We are to be led by the Spirit. We expect supernatural involvement, God to do great and mighty things, right? I'm going to leave us with my favorite guy here, Mr. Tozier, prophet before his time. Folks, I want this to sink in. To me, this this just rocks my world. What God, so he's tying the Old Testament to the New Testament. What God has ever done for anyone, he will do for anyone else. Anything God ever did for anyone in faith, He will do for anyone else who meets His conditions. Faith being the primary one. We have to have faith if God is going to do anything for us. Now folks, that's living by faith. I, uh, Dirk Young, come on up. I commend to us, that's not how we live. We'll live by faith. We sit around and we give excuses for why I, something can't happen in my life. And folks, this is faith. This is when God starts to move in your life and my life. What I realize, no matter what has happened in the Old Testament, God, whatever He's done for anyone else in history, He can do for me by faith. Now, will He is all determined on how I go about it and a lot of other things, right? In His conditions. But do I live with that kind of expectation? What he's done for any other family? What he's done for anyone else out there? Do I believe that the God, he loves me enough that if I, in this exchange, if I come with him with faith and pursue him, he can do it for me. In other words, he never withholds. It's faith is the thing, right, that closes this barrier. And so I just leave us this morning with just this, for all of us to think, man, where do I need to, where's that, where do, what do I need to exchange this morning? Maybe you're watching online or you're here and you need to start in the first step. Lord, I need to... I'm laying it down. Saving faith. I need to come to you, Jesus. I need need that blood to cover me. I need to just hand my sin, shame, and guilt before you. I need your grace, right? Some of us in the the growing faith department, right? What is it we need to do? Can you point out the areas of your life that you have exchanged something, right? Bad language for pure language. I can go down the list, right? For all of things. By faith. God's power is there. It is the resource. Is, and we have watered this. Down. Oh, but we need to add this and this and this. You've got to do this and this to get breakthrough. No, you don't. Nothing's wrong with all these other things. But I'm telling you right now, all you need, all I need ultimately is faith in the blood of Jesus to move through anything that life throws my way. Okay? Now, will he bring other things for me? Maybe. But that's faith. Trusting in Jesus is blood, right? He'll do nothing for us without faith. Hebrews 6 says we cannot please God without faith. We can't please Him without faith. And so I just throw it out to us. Let the Spirit of God as we come to the table. Man, um, 
uh, I'm giving hopefully some conviction this morning because I've been convicted all week by reading these, you know, things that the Lord. But what have you exchanged? Can you, we should stand, be able to stand every Sunday as far as you Jesus and say, let me tell you, I exchanged this whatever and let me tell you what God gave me in return by faith. Does that make sense, gang? Let me, give, I, let me tell you how I gave God my worry about my child or go fill in the blank. And let me tell you the peace that God gave me in exchange by faith because He promised peace that surpasses all understanding. This is how you take hold of the promises of God and how we transform as a person who follows God in faith. All right? So that was a lot. Um, let's continue this discussion and press in with each other, right? So Father, I just pray right now your spirit would move, Lord. Um, I know my own life, God. Lord, I want that exchange. I want that daily exchange, Lord. Show me, reveal. There's a dangerous prayer. Reveal, Lord, or I need to exchange something of my flesh, something I need to surrender, Lord, for what you promise. Lord, help us be those people growing in saving faith, growing, Lord, in sanctifying faith, growing, Lord, in charismatic faith to minister and walk and live like you, God. And Father, let us never forget when we come to this table, this is a celebration of your shed blood to wash it all of our sin away, Lord. We rejoice in you, our mighty Savior. Come, Holy Spirit. Do your work, God. In Jesus' name.